So welcome, welcome to week two of MMM, uh, Monday Masterclass of Movement. Um, so for anyone that wasn't on last week's or has only just listened, we'll just segue into it with just unraveling what we just went ran over briefly last week. Dunk talked about pain, what is pain? Um, pain pops up for a lot of us. And what we, what we sort of unveiled was that pain isn't just one specific thing. Pain's made up of a puzzle, um, a puzzle of all different internal and external factors that come into our life and then they affect our receptors of pain. So what we, what we talked about for 10 minutes was there could be other little things that could be adding to the sensitivity of our pain um, and then not just physiological. So that's super important that we understand that changes in our lifestyle, changes in from moving more to moving less, change in our bodily positions throughout the day, and most importantly, changes to our psychological state as well can have a huge impact on how we feel pain and then how we perceive pain. So what we did was run over for 10 minutes. So if you haven't watched it, go back and check it out. And today might make a little bit more sense because then we got Lauren on and she talked about some pain that she's been experiencing of late that's led her into having heightened sensitivity of pain around her lower back area, which is leading to what a lot of people can go through, which is sciatic pain or nerve pain. So today we're gonna to take a little bit deeper dive into what that pain might be and hopefully give you guys some strategies on how you can deal with pain, but most of all, how you can be aware of what's causing that pain and that it most probably isn't all the time damage. So Dunk, I'll hand it over to you, mate. And um, yeah. No worries, good to be back guys. Thanks for popping on again. Um, so yeah, like uh, Adrian said, this week's all about part two. So last week was part one, understanding the pain experience a little bit. And we had a look at um, Lauren's pain experience. Um, so this is, um, this is obviously pain part two, taking control. So now that we understand a little bit of, of what's going on, other than just pain equaling injury or damage, um, and some of the other pieces that we can influence, we can start to look how we can influence them and how we can take control. Um, so I've kind of put it into two categories here. There's, there's definitely more categories than this, but I just wanted to stick with two that perhaps get talked about at least amongst um, the health professional side of things, but patients might not be overly aware of. But also when we do talk about these things as clinicians, I think that um, it can the mark can get missed a little bit, okay, or, or not quite fully understood. I'm not saying that I'm perfect at them either. Um, it's just that there's a couple of downsides and upsides that, that we may, may want to consider. So the first is what's called the therapeutic alliance. So this is a, a fancy term to basically say how well you get on with your health practitioner or how well you feel listened to, um, and understood and how much help they can provide you now. So we can think of this as rapport or um, a partnership because at the end of the day, it should be, it needs to be a partnership where you uh, and the health practitioner work together because it's your body and you're driving it and you're also the one who's having the pain experience, right? Um, it's not them and whilst they have tools and understanding that can help you at the end of the day uh, it's about you implementing it and how well you get on with the practitioner and believe in what they're doing and, and all of this will have a huge impact on on your prognosis for recovery especially when when it's not uh, a highly um, pathological issue right so it's not Cancer, although even in these kinds of situations, having a good and understanding relationship is really important as well and, and will help you get through those hard times. Just like, just like any relationship, the better it is, the easier it is to get through the bad stuff. But what I wanted to, to highlight is this here. So this comes from a study done in 2012 by Lambert et al. I didn't put the, I should have put the um, reference there, but I didn't. But basically what they showed is that 
the the relationship between you and your clinician now this could be your gp this could be your physio your chiro your exercise physiologist whoever has two times more effectiveness than the actual technique used okay so i as the physio could do a technique to your your back to help your back pain and i've got everything right let's say i got the diagnosis right i got the technique right I performed it competently and well but if you don't feel validated listened to and understood the relief you get from that technique will be half as effective as if we actually have a really good relationship the flip side of that is obviously the dark side of that is I could be a really good salesperson and give you a, a lot of understanding and rapport and you feel well connected and do a treatment modality that's um, low value or not overly effective or not particularly evidence-based, and this happens a lot, um, and you become uh, then addicted is not the right term, but you become reliant on what I do to you, um, and then you get stuck in a cycle as well. So you feel like what I'm doing is having a greater effect than what it actually is. So this is a, very much a two-way street, but it is extremely, uh, extremely important that you find someone that you feel can understand you, but then not just understand you, help you plan and progress forward, not just do the same technique over and over and over again. And this is where self-efficacy, or which is what we use in the, the health game, but it's could be termed self-empowerment. This is where the reins of control are handed from me to you, okay? So we've got a good relationship. I, I'm doing the, the, the right kinds of techniques. And as we go, you're getting more and more understanding, more and more control over what's going on with your, with your pain experience. Um, and these, these can be um, things like not stopping everything in your life. A lot of people, especially with chronic pain, fall into this, this spiral downwards of being told to stop doing things because like we talked about last week, they're fearful that it's causing more damage or they can't take control of the pain that they're having. They don't have a good understanding, etc. Um, and that's really debilitating for your feeling of self-worth and self-empowerment. And we all know from other times in our lives, probably where you feel like you have a lack of control, what are the emotions and feelings that come up with that? Their, their fear, their resentment, um, there's like a, a lack of clarity, um, and over and, and that keeps spinning round and round. And then we stop something and we lose a little piece of ourselves. Maybe it's, you know, playing with the grandkids or doing the gardening. We can't do that now. or We think we can't do that now um, because someone told us not to. And it, it obviously really affects um, how we perceive ourselves, how, how we identify and how we want to show up in the world. Uh, and like we looked at last week, it's, um, it's not always the case. Often it's completely inconsequential. Yeah, it might hurt a little bit to do, um, but it's actually not not doing us any damage. And when we understand that, we can not stop and keep going. And that's kind of what I mean by ask questions and test the results. So you hear a lot in the, the medical world uh, and the health world that it's, it's science-based uh, and that kind of stuff. And, and look, it, it definitely is. We do a lot of research on, you know, broad population groups, what, what is most likely to, to affect the vast majority of people. But really when we drill down on scientific thinking and understanding is it's really at the core about forming a question or what we call a hypothesis and then testing it against uh, a result. Um, and often that's completely forgotten. We hear a lot of health professionals like, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's 90% likely to be this, which, which is accurate and true, but we need to also remember that you sitting in front of me is an N1 study. It's not, 
It's not the, the 100,000 people enlisted in this epidemiological study. It's the one person. And whilst statistically you might fit in this group, uh, we need to be a little bit more drilling down and asking, well, where in this do you fit? And if the data says this, does this apply to you? And then being able to pretty well objectively say, well, it looks to be this way, but then the ability to shift our question or shift our solution if, if things don't look like they're going that way. So this all kind of about taking control. And that still might seem at the moment a little bit like, oh, I don't really understand where to go and how to take this. And that's where this comes in. So this is something I've formulated over the last couple of years. I've adapted it from a couple of different places, but um, the first is this tier continuum. Now, don't think of this as like stage one, stage two, stage three. They really kind of mesh together and we continue along this path. This is just the best representation I could kind of put together of it, um, but it's definitely more fluid than this. And we all sit on this continuum at any one point in time, okay? Um, whether it's performance like lifting the grandkids up or doing, you know, performing a, a world record at the Olympic Games, or we're trying to improve our knee pain so that we can start to walk better, which would fit kind of into this facilitation phase. Uh, and then move on and so forth. And how we figure out where we sit is with the traffic light rule. And that's why they're these different colors. So basically the traffic light rule is a model to kind of understand where we sit and if we should, should continue with an activity. Um, we've got a podcast on this. If you do look for the Transcend Health podcast, you'll find a bit more info on this, but um, basically red, isn't bad it just means we're not ready and we need to stop and look to go in another direction and how we get a red light is we do an activity it might hurt to do that's not really important if you can tolerate the discomfort of the activity and it's not getting worse continue with it the question is what happens after so you've got a baseline of discomfort or pain you do the activity and then afterwards, the pain escalates, it spreads, its intensity rises. That would be a red light. Okay, pretty simple. Like I said, though, it doesn't mean it's not a good movement or you shouldn't do it. It just means you're not ready yet. Yellow light is, it was pretty inconsequential. You did it, it hurt a bit, but then it didn't make your pain, discomfort worse or better. And these, these are likely to have no consequence on on your issues. So this is where, where we often tell people stop doing walking the dog every morning because your knee hurts. Um, and we, we often then disempower the person incorrectly because it's really of no consequence. And the green light's the one we're looking for. It's where we get a positive change in your symptoms. So when we see this, we know, okay, we need to head in this direction for a period of time. That doesn't mean it's the only thing that's going to get you better, uh, and which we'll talk about in other episodes where we use progression and progressive overload and, and these kinds of tools to keep stepping you forward. But how we know when to step you forward is by application of, of this rule. So that gives you a bit of an idea of where we're at now. I'm going just to stop sharing my screen, if I can. Maybe controls, where are you? Screen sharing has stopped, yeah, cool. And we're going to go back to Lauren, who we chatted to last week. So Lauren, can you unmute yourself? Hello. How are you doing? Good, how are you? Good. So I'll just quickly do a, a real brief recap of, of what we heard last week and just correct me if I've forgotten anything or, or if I've misunderstood, but Lauren had an episode of what she would term sciatic pain, so pain running down the leg about 12 months ago. Um, it kind of settled down and over that 12 months has waxed and waned in intensity and pain location and it flared up about a week ago now, maybe a bit longer, um, because 
She's gone into to isolation, started you know, jogging more than she used to, not doing the same exercise type that she used to and is sitting down and working from home in a different environment than she used to. And now she's got this left-sided, low back, buttock, glute kind of pain. Have I kind of got that in a nutshell? Yep, pretty much, yep. Sweet. So just before we get started, what have you found this week? Has anything changed since last week? Um, I found I, I've still been um, walking and running a lot more than I would have, but I've been before I've been running, I've been trying to do a lot more of a warm up, and I found that that has helped me. So the pain is kind of it's still lingering around. I can't seem to get rid of it entirely, but it's definitely not as bad as it was the week before when I first started doing the running. Awesome. And for those that were on the call last week. Well, remember we talked to Lauren about her pain experience and this fits into what I just talked about where she was like, you know, a lot of the time, a lot of the advice that people get here would be like, stop running, it's bad for you. And what we talked about was, no, running actually might be the thing that gets you better. We just need to think about how we're approaching it. And even with last week, with just that little bit of understanding, which was the theme of last week's pain talk, she's already taken some control and seen a, a level of improvement just from those few small changes. And this is, this is what we're talking about. This is how good proactive treatment looks rather than uh, reactive, just stop, 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 stop. And then we sort of cave into this, this pain. Um, but now let's try and take it another step further, Lauren. Mm -hmm. This week, even though you've had some improvement, you said the pain's still lingering around. Yeah. What, um, what activities or when do you notice the pain's getting worse? It's usually not while I'm actually doing activities and that's what I struggle with. So I find that when I actually, when, a lot of the time when I do the activity, I don't know, it, it feels okay to do and it's after that I start to feel some of that pain. So that's where I really, to find out what I should should and shouldn't do really yeah for sure so um, when you say after do you mean immediately after the activity or is it like you go for a jog and then a couple of hours the next day it's it's worse probably like if, so I went for a jog on Saturday morning and it was probably maybe an hour or two after, after I sort of stopped. So I cooled down a little bit. I sort of went for a bit of a walk after. And then after I sat down for a while, it was probably mm. when I stood up and started to move around again. That that's when I started to feel it more. Right. So you had activity. I did, yeah. I did feel it while I was running a little bit just because I'm, I'm not a runner and I just feel pain the whole time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, it's more like sort of once I cool down and stop for a little bit and then try and start something again, that's when I kind of go, oh, that's really sore and achy again. Yeah, gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so there's a couple of things here. So with the traffic light rule, you had some discomfort during. Um, that's okay. Again, like we talked about, as long as you can tolerate it. And often that is what, what you just talked about there is like, you're not a runner, you've just started. So there's a level of discomfort just to, to doing the activity. And that, that goes for all exercises. I mean, I've lifted weights for a long time and you go heavy and it, it's not, it's not nice. Mm. Um, but you, you have a better understanding of it. So you don't worry about it so much. Um, and, and obviously your tissues are, are, are built to, to withstand it. Um, but then immediately after you didn't have extra pain, you like, then you've sat down, cool, like watched some telly, did some work, whatever it happened to be. And then it's that initial get up and like, Oh, Oh, what's that? That's aching now. That's really sore. Yeah. So this, this here doesn't, this is a bit of a caveat to what we just talked about with the traffic light rule. And this is where having a, a bit more understanding can help as well. That phenomenon is kind of like um, when you've done some new exercise or you've worked in the garden and you haven't worked in the garden for a, a year and the next day or a couple of hours later, you start to get that soreness and stiffness. This is 
this is normal and, and okay. So that's not exactly what we're talking about with the traffic light rule. Obviously, we we want to we want to just monitor that, but um, it's not necessary. That's not necessarily a red light. A red light would be more. I finish my run and I'm really really sore for for the rest of the day, kind of day. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a that's how we can apply that rule. Now, it, it's not an exact science, but that's kind of what it sounds like to me. The next question is, let's try and apply the rule live right now. And I know that the time's getting on a little bit, so sorry about that, guys. If you want to jump on, I don't think you're rude if you need to go to work or anything. Um, but what I would like to know is, sitting there right now, are you in any discomfort, pain, anything like that? A little bit, yeah. So I've been out, I've been out running this morning and, yeah, a little bit. Though, like, because I, I guess I'm not sitting very well, <laughs> but yes, I am a little bit in my lower back. Okay, cool. So we'll call that your baseline. That's what you're currently feeling, and just mm -hmm. now take a mental note of, of how that feels. Okay. What I want you to do now, Lauren, is have a stand up. Now it doesn't matter if we can't see you too well, but but if we can, it will be helpful. Um, Cool. So standing there right now, just mental note of that baseline. Um, can you bend forward for me like you're going to touch your toes? Mm -hmm. Cool. Come back up. Did that aggravate your discomfort at all? No. Didn't. No. Felt the same. Sweet. Yeah. Can you... Sorry. Can you slide your pelvis side to side like this for me? Does that bother it? That does a little bit, yes. Cool. Again, just take a mental note of how that's feeling right now. We'll use that as a second baseline. Yep. Third one is like this. Yeah, that does big time. Okay. I feel a real pinch as soon as I sort of go back like that. Okay, cool. That'll be our third baseline. So now we have three things to measure against and using the traffic light rule, three is a good number. One is okay, but if we see a change in three, we, we definitely know we're on the right track. Based on what you told me last week, Lauren, and, and kind of what you're telling me this week, I want to try one thing with you. Can you lie down on the floor and I'll just change my camera angle. So lying on the floor, I don't need to see you do this. Okay. <laughs> All I need to do is get you to come up into this kind of a stretch and down. And I want you to do that kind of 10 times, okay? Yep. So coming up and down. And is that feeling okay? Yeah, it pinches, but it feels okay. Yep. And is that tolerable, that pinch, or is it getting worse? Yeah, it's, to it's tolerable. Cool. So again, we'll keep working with this. Do a couple more. And now what I'll get you to do is, as you come up, get to the top, breathe out, and then go back down. That would have felt a little bit more pressure, or a little bit more pinch in that low back, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah. Do two more. Once you've done two more like that with the breath, I'll get you to um, to stand back up. Like, all right, she's still alive. We're okay. Uh, <laughs> so now standing there, we want to ask those questions. Okay, mm -hmm. one is the baseline in standing, has it changed? So it might still be painful, but has it shifted location? Has it changed intensity? Has it gotten worse or is it still the same? Uh, it's, it's definitely not gotten worse. It's probably no. feels a little bit looser maybe. So maybe slight, slight improvement. So there's one tick. So that's one green light, okay? And this is how this, is how this, this kind of works, guys. The one green light, it's not 100% better and I'm not expecting it to be right now. We're just looking for a direction. Mm -hmm. um, can you do your, your hip pivot thing? 
Now you said that was painful before. Has that improved? Has that gotten worse or has it stayed the same? Uh, it's probably a little bit looser, so I improved slightly, I'd say. Slight improvement, cool. Yeah. And then the last one was standing up, bending backwards. Yeah, that actually feels much better than it did the first time I did it. Cool, so tick, tick, tick. So three green lights, and that's, that's kind of what we're after. And, and again, guys, this is how, um, this is why we can deliver, Adrian and I can deliver healthcare and stuff via Skype because we've got more tools than just putting our hands on. Not that they're not important, they're just not as important as people think. But what we now have, Lauren, is a starting point to progress forward a little bit further. Now, don't get me wrong, um, this isn't the only exercise and, and we will shift gears and get harder and things as, as we roll out a treatment plan with you. <laughs> Where you can start is, as of today, and here's, here's a, pretty much a free consult for you. As <laughs> of today, I would like you to try and accumulate 100 back bends on the floor per day. Okay. So just like you did for the next kind of three days, try and do 100 of those on the floor, broken up through the day. Okay? Um, so every time you finish a Zoom meeting with work, jump on the floor, do it. Every time you make your coffee, this kind of thing can help pin it with regular activities and help mm -hmm. you get consistency. Okay. okay. So if Lauren was coming to see me in the clinic or we we're doing a telehealth conference like this, um, that's the, the one thing she would go home with today. And next session, we will look at how to progress that either make the exercise harder or more intense or shift into another direction, okay? Where we maybe get some other muscles working a bit more, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's kind of how it works. Um, that's all I've got to really present on today. Um, does anyone have any questions? We've got about four minutes left of, of uh the talk yeah, on that too done because that was awesome like what i think needs to be brought up as well so that anyone else on this call that might be experiencing whether it's back pain um because i know a couple of you do have that now just remember that that treatment exercise and that um observation was done from dunk to lauren you 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 are all different individuals who have different symptoms who have different ways of heightening pain or how they tighten or whatever it is so don't think that you going off today and doing 100 back bends will improve your pain as well so just understand the basic methodology of what was just happened what, what just happened so it's like assess it you can self-assess as well, like Lauren did. She, she reacted to how she felt in different positions but didn't attach damage to the pain. As she moved more in that movement, she became freer. Okay, so just, to, just wanted to bring that up because that was awesome, but just know that how Dunk treats, how I would treat would be individualized to the person presenting because that's not the only thing that's probably specific to Lauren's pain or achiness that she experiences throughout her day especially after she she runs so just wanted to, yeah just want to bring yeah that. It, it was more to demonstrate so the actual technique used may not be the actual technique for you right now it's more to demonstrate how to apply the um the principle the the performance continuum um and the traffic light rule so hopefully you, you guys can start cogitating that over and obviously if you do need some help with it reach out to AO or I and, and we can help obviously guide you through it a little bit more. Um, that'll do for this week. Next